When Chauncey Bailey was gunned down in Oakland, California nearly two years ago, his killing <laughs> shook up his city and his profession. The reporter got his head blown off. It's that simple. Bailey was editor of the weekly Oakland Post. He was investigating a black Muslim splinter group, allegedly using a local bakery as a front for criminal activities when he was shot. You can't let that go unanswered because what happens to the next reporter who is investigating a story that someone doesn't want him to, to report? But at a time when newsrooms and news budgets are shrinking, some feared Chauncey Bailey's work might go unfinished. So with some foundation support, two dozen news organizations agreed somewhat reluctantly to collaborate. Collaboration was something we shied away from, really, because it was get the story, get it first, and scoop somebody. The reporters who joined forces on the Chauncey Bailey project admit putting aside competition wasn't always easy. And if you have secret sources, are you going to share them with all the people in this room? Well, yeah. But that was hard. <laughs> yeah, there's been a few chairs thrown. <laughs> Their work was low budget. Two of the three lead reporters didn't have jobs. Bob Butler laid off from radio. Mary Fricker retired. But on story after story, they pressed the police investigation. Their reporting revealed links between the lead detective on the case and the black Muslim group's leader, Yusuf Bey. Last month, the detective was suspended. The big breakthrough came when the reporters obtained a secretly recorded jailhouse video of Bay and found something detectives had missed. They heard Bay whispering he had the gun used to kill Bailey. The gun that was used was in my closet. That admission became headline news. It gets the message out and it sends the message that investigative reporting is still alive. Finally, two years after the killing, Bay has been indicted for Chauncey Bailey's murder. He'll be arraigned tomorrow. For the reporters, getting results became more important than getting a scoop, a team effort that would have made the slain journalist proud. John Blackstone, CBS News, San Francisco. with two straight lefts to the face and brought over that hard right to the head. High on the temple and Max tied him up to the clinch and broke ground. Is back against the ropes again there. Not too close to the ropes. Lewis out and Lewis missed with a left swing but in close. Brought up a hard right over the hook and a right to the jaw. And again a right to the body. A left hook, a right to the head, a left to the head, a right. Smelling is going down. But he held to his feet, held to the rope. Look to his corner in helplessness, and Schmeling is down. Schmeling is down. The count is four. It, and he's up, and Lewis, right and left to the head, a left to the jaw, a right to the head, and Donovan is watching carefully. Lewis measures him, right to the body, a left up to the jaw, and Schmeling is down. The count is five. Five, six, seven, eight. The men are in the ring. The fight is over. Islam in America first flourished thanks to a man who changed his name, from Robert Poole to Elijah Muhammad. He was a poor laborer who left the cotton fields of Georgia for Detroit. In the 1930s, Detroit and other northern cities were the promised land for poor southern blacks seeking jobs and new lives. It was here that Elijah Muhammad believed he met Allah in the form of a man. Just one likeness of this Arab man remains. He apparently went by the name of Master Farad Muhammad, and he persuaded Elijah to create a new religion in which black men were God's divine people. Elijah wrote his own holy text, the message to the black man in America, using references from the Quran, but also from the Bible. He wrote that Allah himself had told him that over 6,000 years ago, the white race was created by a crazy black chemist. Caucasians, especially those with pale skin and blue eyes, were the devil itself. He preached that blacks should have pride in their race. He forbade alcohol and drugs and urged fathers to support their families. 
White America is doomed, he wrote, soon to be destroyed by a huge spaceship, the Mother of Planes, which carries flying saucers and will drop bombs that fall one mile into the earth before exploding. His creed was a hodgepodge of folklore and superstition, but he built up what would become the Nation of Islam using the language and rhetoric of the Muslim faith. In 1955, when Elijah Muhammad visited the New York Temple, it was to inspect the work of the ambitious and outspoken young minister who had transformed tiny storefronts along the East Coast into a congregation of thousands. Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad's message made a whole lot of people feel whole again, human being again. Some of them came out and found a new meaning to their manhood and their womanhood. Had Elijah Muhammad tried to introduce an orthodox form of Arab-oriented Islam, I doubt if he would have attracted 500 people. But he introduced a form of Islam that could communicate with the people he had to deal with. He was the king to those who had no king. He was the messiah to those some people thought unworthy of a messiah. The teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is like uh, nothing I have ever taken. It's a medicine. Right. You see, right. it's a medicine that has cured me of all my ills. Yes, Because I was a sick man. That's right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. when I embraced the teachings of Honorable Elijah Muhammad, these teachings cured me of these ills. Right. I'm a well man now. Right. And I yeah. feel good. That's right. As long as you stay with the doctor, you continue to Yes, sir. Uh, yes, right. sir. What about you, brother? How do you feel about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Honorable Elijah Muhammad is trying to teach all our original people they are in bad shape. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. I'm Elijah Muhammad trying to wake him up. Inside Muslim temples, no white people were allowed. Members worked to build a self-sufficient community, founded on strict rules and absolute obedience. The nation set up Muslim schools for its children, teaching mathematics, science, history and Arabic. Who is the original man? The original man is the Asiatic black man. The makers of all the queens of the planet Earth. Muslim women studied nutrition, child rearing, and guidelines on how to care for their husbands. Muslim men studied parental responsibility, history, and religion. The elite corps, called the Fruit of Islam, was trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat and was expected to protect the temples and to punish any members who spoke out against the messenger.
I went with Malcolm X in 1954. At that time, I could not even get a black professional to go to a meeting with me on 116th Street to meet with Malcolm. I do not criticize them. I, that I'm trying to assess for you the time. Yes, 1954. If you were a lawyer in 1954, uh, you were seen identifying with Malcolm X. That was not a healthy thing. Only one person did that, that my brother would go with me. Uh, we went together. Uh, the climate was bad. And there was much talk of revolution. But the black nationalists who on her, I used to get in trouble, a lot of trouble with them for being with the NACP. And I remember how happy I was to go with Malcolm. Uh, and I was able to do it because of the climate of my family background. You see, the Communist Party uh, uh, moves around and people <laughs> say the, uh, the first is son, that's John's son, that's Jay's brother, that's Lee's brother, you got to look out for them. I charge the white man with being the greatest robber on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest deceiver on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest troublemaker on earth. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I ask you, bring back a verdict of guilty as charged. The indictment you have just heard is being delivered over and over again in most of the major cities across the country. This charge comes at the climax of a morality play called The Trial. The plot, indeed the message of the play, is that the white man has been put on trial for his sins against the black man. He has been found guilty. The sentence is death. The play is sponsored, produced, by a Negro religious group who call themselves the Muslims. They use a good deal of the paraphernalia of the traditional religion of Islam, but they are fervently disavowed by Orthodox Muslims. These homegrown Negro American Muslims are the most powerful of the black supremacist groups. They now claim a membership of at least a quarter of a million Negroes. Their doctrine is being taught in 50 cities across the nation. Let no one underestimate the Muslims. To make his message clear, Malcolm used his own life as a lesson for all black Americans. He preached it in fables and parables. And later, in writing his autobiography with Alex Haley, he sought some control over how his life would be interpreted in the future. I would be rather taken by a statement he would make of himself. He would say, I am a part of all I have met. And by that, he meant that all the things he had done in his earlier life had exposed him to things, had taught him skills of one another sort of, all of which had synthesized into the Malcolm who became the spokesman for the Nation of Islam.
My recollection was that in this now famous two and a quarter page document, there were about 35 names listed. This is pretty serious. Have we had anything as serious as this so far? Oh yes, I think we've got something much more serious right now. Uh, uh, right this well, moment. I'm talking about up yes, to the yes. prior to this hearing. May, may, answer, may answer that question, Mr. Chairman. Right. I think we've got a much more serious situation now in communist infiltration of the CIA. Disturbs me beyond words. Well, we haven't. The members of the committee have not been advised, and I do think that... Oh, yes, they have. Oh, yes, they have. have we, uh, the names and, uh, of the people... I, I've discussed this matter with the members of the committee. I've also discussed with the members of the committee the question of communist infiltration of atomic and hydrogen bomb plants. I felt that was, I think, even more important than this infiltration at... Uh, may I... Uh, may, may, may the, the, just just let me finish and view this one. One point. May I uh, have from the files all the memos and, and meetings and minutes with reference to this matter so that uh, we on the committee can you, be fully informed? You, you, you certainly may, Senator. Certainly may. The cultural flat feet of the FBI were on the warpath. It was becoming difficult for the American government openly to support abstract expressionist painters with a left-wing past. The FBI and the political right wing saw these painters and their work as subversive, even treasonous. The solution was to go covert, not a difficult reflex for the CIA. Well, of course, one feature of doing it covertly is that the administration, the executive branch, could make the decision and do it. I mean, and it makes it a lot easier than the kind of debate that would occur in, with the Congress and every, every opinion uh, element in the country on everything, including some of the very retrograde people who say, no, you can't support those kinds of people. They're terrible. They're softies. They're, they're soft on communism and all the rest of it. So what America got was the formation of an unofficial hidden arts council, a consortium which consisted of the cultural elite, the museum directors, the philanthropists, the urbane millionaires, the entrepreneurs, the critics, magazine editors, and CIA personnel. Exclusive clubs and bars were where members of the consortium did business. One of the network's leading lights was John McCloy, a former OSS agent and one of the architects of the CIA. He later had a key position on the Ford Foundation, a hugely rich charitable trust. At the same time, McCloy is chairman of the Ford Foundation, and uh, according to records found in the Ford Foundation's own archives, you, you can see that uh, early in the 50s, the foundation uh, was approached repeatedly by the CIA to uh, help them provide cover for operations that they wanted to fund overseas. But existing foundations like Ford had their limitations. They were bureaucratic, and officially at least entirely independent of the CIA. Over large dinners and ice-cold martinis, the agency's old school ties met to discuss more flexible ways of funding. Why not create new foundations if the existing ones were a pain? We would go to somebody in New York who was a, a well-known rich person and we would say we want to set up a foundation and we want we would tell him what we were trying to do and pledge him to secrecy and he would say of course uh, I'll do it and uh, then you would publish a, a letterhead and his name would be on it and it would be the foundation. <laughs> it, was a, it was really a pretty simple device. In this way, the CIA set up a huge network of phony foundations. One, for instance, was the Farfield. The Farfield Foundation was a, a CIA foundation, and there were many such. And we used uh, foundations for... We used the names of foundations for many purposes, but the foundation didn't exist except on paper.
John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. Mr. Muhammad had his son call Malcolm. He said, Brother Minister Malcolm, my father told me to tell you, and we're calling all over the country, that John F. Kennedy was assassinated and that we should not say anything in a derogatory way whatsoever because the man is the president of the United States and that people love him. The Muslims had scheduled a rally at the Manhattan Center in New York City. The day of the rally, the messenger called Malcolm to remind him to teach the spiritual side and avoid saying anything about the president's death. But he was clearly nervous about what he might say. He spoke from a prepared speech, um, never specifically mentioned Kennedy, um, but then as if courting disaster, uh, he opened the floor up to questions. Normally he would speak, but he wouldn't ask no, answer no, ask for question and answer. But this day, he asked for question and answer. And he went into this litany, um, comparing other leaders around the world um, who had somehow suffered at the hands of the United States government or its agents. Um, and how that compared to what had just happened to Kennedy. And he said, Patrice Lumumba died, um, and his wife became a widow. Uh, his people had their leader cut down, and the U.S. government had been involved in doing that. And he went through a string of these always winding up with the involvement of the United States government. So that the final point that when you do those kinds of things all around the world, uh, you set up a situation, an atmosphere, an environment uh, in the world. And sooner or later, those chickens come home to roost. When he answered, I was really, I was really took, took, took back. I, could, I didn't understand that. And he answered the question, he said, well, he said, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but as far as I'm concerned, it's a case of the chickens coming home to roost. Naturally, John Ali, the national secretary, was there. And that's how Mr. Muhammad got the news so fast. This statement is from Messenger Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Muslims of America. Uh, Minister Malcolm Shabazz addressing a public meeting at Manhattan Center in New York City on Sunday, December the 1st did not speak for the Muslims when he made comments on the death of the president, John F. Kennedy. He was speaking for himself and not Muslims in general. And Minister Malcolm has been suspended from public speaking for the time being. While the Nation of Islam publicly grieved for the slain president, the leadership announced the silencing of Malcolm X for 90 days. He was to give no speeches and to have no contact with the press. Well, we were doing a lot of Kennedy stories and there was going to be a little one talking about Malcolm having been suspended. And I was expecting, pick up the phone, I'd get a quote and that would be it. In this case, he held me on the phone for longer than I had expected. And he sounded upset, he sounded worried, and it was the first time I had ever sensed vulnerability in this guy who I th had always been accustomed to thinking of as an extremely strong man. Newspapers predicted a power struggle within the nation of Islam. It was later learned the FBI fed stories to local reporters in an attempt to deepen the rift between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. Guy is brushing aside Liston's punches now with his gloves. The pattern of the fight has changed too because Clay is now coming forward. He's got Liston on the retreat.
six rounds completed and the convention hall is rising not to the champion here but to the challenger Sonny Liston the challenger Cassius Clay an amazing night Liston is the man who among other things has stopped such fighters as Zora Folly Roy Harris, Nino Valdez, Cleveland Williams, Mike DeJohn, all these he's stopped. But as it's going now, he can't stop and he doesn't look like stopping Cassius Marcellus Clay, the man who's boasted since 1960 when he won the Olympic light heavyweight title that he'd become the professional heavyweight champion of the world. And the signs are now as we come to the seventh round that that's just what he might do. Happened. Clay has won. Clay has won. Something has happened in Liston's corner. They're not going on. And Cassius Clay has won after six rounds. And there's the champion, the ex-champion, sitting despondently in his corner. A sensation to end all sensations. It's all over at the end of the sixth round. But Cassius Clay is the new champion of the world. On March 8, 1964, Malcolm announced he was leaving the Nation of Islam. He formed a new religious organization called the Muslim Musk Incorporated for those who followed him out of the nation. Malcolm was certainly a beloved son of the Harlem community and people were interested in his side of the story. Elijah Muhammad was uh, a, somebody in a picture on the wall, someone whose name was mentioned, but Harlem didn't know him. They knew Malcolm and loved Malcolm and remained loyal to Malcolm uh, long after that split. Uh, Gene, Gene, you were the, uh, I believe you were the only press fan in the, uh, in the auditorium when Malcolm X was shot. Yes, that's correct. I went as an individual. Is I, that how you happened to get in? Well, today's my day off, and uh, as a reporter, I'm naturally interested in current events. And this being the tense kind of situation in this part of town that it is, I decided that I would attend today, not as a reporter, but as a private citizen. Well, just what happened? You mean when Malcolm was shot, I assume? Exactly. I was sitting in the front row, the very right in front of Malcolm, uh, in fact, and uh, he came out on the stage. The uh, introductory speaker turned over the platform to him, and he raised his hand in uh, a Muslim greeting. So, Salaam Alaikum. At that point, uh, I, I heard a rumbling behind me, and I'm sure everyone else did too, and I turned around in my seat to, to see what it was. And uh, then we saw, like, I saw two guys standing up, and the next thing, my next impression, it all happened very rapidly, as you can understand, is of the gunshots. And uh, I saw Malcolm had his hand up. He had said, he said, stay cool, stay calm, or something like that. And uh, just then the gunfire went off, and his, his hand was up. I remember this. I turned around quickly, and the next thing I saw was Malcolm falling back in a dead faint. Um, right after that, of course, like everybody else, you know, chairs were being knocked over, there were screams, uh, everybody was in a mad confusion. I dove for the floor and scrambled behind a rampart on the side. My first impression was, of course, as a reporter, you know, to get to a telephone and file my story. And I started crawling uh, towards the back of the auditorium, and, and uh, oh, I incidentally saw a guy running out, or evidently one of the perpetrators running out, and uh, he was shooting like a cowboy all over the place. And, of course, the, uh, the, the, the shots were going off wildly and after that there was there was pandemonium in the place
in a technical sense, it really started in the 1960s, and some um, sources say specifically in 1964, um, with a man named Clarence Smith, or Clarence Smith Jowers, um, also known as Clarence 13X, uh, known as Clarence uh, Pudding was his nickname, and um, eventually he began to call himself Allah. Now, okay. this, this guy um, was actually a decorated war hero from uh, the Korean War, and when he um, got out of the um, these military in 1960, he moved back, uh, I believe it was, to uh, Harlem, if I'm not mistaken, and he began to listen to Malcolm X uh, teach in one of the mosques there. Mm -hmm. And over the course of time, um, and accounts vary, they differ here somewhat over the reason why he became somewhat disaffected uh, by the Nation of Islam, some say because of um, the exclusive claims of divinity of, of Wallace D. Fard, um, who, who founded the Nation of Islam proper, um, or because uh, uh, Fard appeared to be at least partly Caucasian, if not uh, completely Caucasian, which seemed to fly in the face of you know what they believe, or because he wanted to establish his own um, religion, if right. you will, and, uh, and get paid, you know, to go after money. But uh, no matter what uh, the cause was, you can pick among those. He eventually left and um, he started his own movement uh, called the Five Percenters. I've been in Islam. Okay. I've been in Islam since I was 12, 13 years old. Because I was introduced to the 5 percent nation of Islam when I was 12 or 13 years old. That. You know what I'm saying? And it's been that ever since. So So for the people that don't know, what is the 5 percent? The 5 percent nation of Islam is it's a it's a it's a it's a division of the nation of Islam that was created by the father Clarence 13X, who used to be a Muslim. He used to be a part of the nation of Islam. Muslim. He was a one of the head generals of the, the Food of Islam, which is the Muslim security at the time. And this is back in like the 1930s and the 1933, 1935, 1934 time frame. And um, the father, Clarence 13X, um, you know, he was a brother that felt like it was important that the urban community was being communicated to as far as, you know, the science behind everything in life in the way that was prioritized just as much as it was for Muslims that, you know, were born into being Muslim or that had converted into the nation of Islam. Now the father Clarence 13X, he felt like, you know, a lot of these kids in the urban community, they ain't had a discipline or the mindset or the conditioning to want to convert. You know what I'm saying? So that still didn't mean that they didn't deserve the science. That still didn't mean that they didn't deserve the truth. That still didn't mean that they didn't deserve the information that could help empower them. So what he did was he went in the hood and he would see these kids on the corner gambling, rolling dice, selling drugs or whatever they was doing. And he went to them and partook. He, 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 he felt it was necessary to sacrifice himself in a way where even if he had to partake in the activities that was improper, to clean them up. If they smoked, he, was, he smoked with them. If they rolled dice, he rolled dice with them to make them feel comfortable enough to embrace him in their circle and be willing to listen to the information. You know what I'm saying? And that's what he did.
Good evening. For 20 years, beginning in the late 1960s, the infamous Black Mafia was involved in extortion, murder, drug trafficking, and embezzlement in the predominantly African-American sections of Philadelphia. The organized group, one of the bloodiest crime syndicates in modern U.S. history, collapsed in the late 1980s after several successful prosecutions and internal conflict. Who were Philadelphia's Black Mafia, and what can we learn from them about organized crime in general? We'll talk about that with Sean Patrick Griffin, a former Philadelphia police officer turned Penn State faculty member. His newest book, Black Brothers, Inc., The Violent Rise and Fall of Philadelphia's Black Mafia, has been optioned by a Hollywood production company to be made into a major motion picture. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I think it's safe to say that when most of us think a mafia or organized crime, we don't think black mafia. And yet this was a group that uh, made its mark for 20 years beginning in the 1960s. And you say was linked to some of the most heinous crimes in Philadelphia history. Who were they? Well, Philadelphia's black mafia is a fascinating group. They began, um, by most accounts, in the early to mid-1960s. Uh, they formed around certain particular neighborhoods in Philadelphia. Most of them knew each other, either from childhood or from mo mostly from youth gangs. Many of them had violent criminal backgrounds. In fact, all of them had criminal backgrounds. Um, in the early years, meaning the mid-1960s, for the most part, we're talking in the dozens, um, they self-selected themselves by territory in the sense that people knew who they were. Their mainstay in the early to mid-1960s was extortion. What that meant literally was that they would go up to drug dealers and other illicit entrepreneurs like numbers runners, prostitution rings, and ask them for a street tax. And if people didn't pay, uh, they would be harmed physically. And that's how they began. Nothing spectacular, and of course back then law enforcement for the most part treated organized crime as an Italian specific phenomenon. So all throughout the 1960s as the black mafia grew and grew, um, they were pretty much untouched by law enforcement. And Sorry, go ahead. No, no, but shelves are, are lined, uh, uh, bookshelves are lined with books on the Sicilian Mafia, the Russian Mafia, the Irish Mafia, um, but nothing until your book about the Black Mafia. How has it gone under the radar for so long? I think in Philadelphia's case, Philadelphia's Black Mafia was a, a much larger deal in African-American sections of the city than the Bruno crime family was in Italian sections. And I say that for one reason. Because law enforcement was not watching, it was impossible for people in black sections of the city to imagine that these ultra-violent criminals, and I'll get to their crimes in a moment, but these ultra-violent criminals were not being targeted by law enforcement. Uh, and one of the fascinating things about Philadelphia's Black Mafia, they rose to power just as the federal government in the 1960s had what they thought was a revolutionary idea of providing funding to gangsters and to gang members. And what that meant in Philadelphia's case was, if you were a member of the Black Mafia, you could actually apply for government funding, and that's why the book is called Black Brothers, Inc. They actually incorporated themselves in October of 1973. And received and were, government and, funds. Absolutely, and, and they actually had a storefront on South Street in South Philadelphia. And so for the poor victims to all this mayhem that they're causing, and by the way, the Black Mafia murdered far more people than the Bruno crime family ever did in Philadelphia. They murdered over four dozen people. Uh, to, if you're a member of an African-American section of the city, you're watching known criminals not only getting money, but taking photo ops with politicians, being listed on the grants. One of the things that struck me as a researcher 30 years after the fact was, I wrongly and naively assumed that surely if I got the government documents, these black mafia members would not have put their own name on the documents, that they would have used some front name or front company. And in fact, they used their own name because that was the idea. And when I tracked down the politicians who were responsible for giving that money out, and I asked them, do you, do you look back on those times and question the public policy there of actually courting known criminals? Uh, and the response I got uniformly from politicians was, those were very, very tough times in urban areas. 
crime was running rampant and we were trying to do radical things. Mm. And the idea that that would actually embolden these criminals to then take these pictures and show the photographs on the street to all their victims, people who they were extorting attacks from, whether it was drug dealers, but more importantly, legal business owners. And so you think you're going, they would, they would go up to business owners and say, you really don't think you're going to go to law enforcement. They're tight with us. You saw the pictures yesterday in the paper, didn't you? Well, California has a lot of creepy killers in its past. The Night Stalker, the Zodiac Killer, Charles Manson, the list goes on. But 40 years ago, San Francisco was terrorized by mass murderers who are rarely mentioned. Linda Yee found out why no one wants to talk about the zebra killers, even today. San Francisco police have intensified their so-called Operation Zebra. It was national news. Racially motivated murders, nicknamed Zebra, for the police radio ban assigned to the case. All the same pattern. White people shot down by a black gunman for no apparent reason. Suspects roaming San Francisco streets, mutilating, torturing, and killing. They eventually uh, decapitated her. Lou Calabro was a patrol sergeant during that first Zebra attack. A young couple kidnapped while walking in their Telegraph Hill neighborhood in October 1973. The husband survived. Simply pulled out his gun and fired at me twice. The future mayor, Art Agnos, was their sixth victim. Then I looked down, I was bleeding. Shot after attending a community meeting on Petrero Hill. The killers were tied to a militant black Muslim group known as the Death Angels. And in order to be initiated into this um, very murderous group, uh, they had to kill a white person. By Christmas, more than a dozen people were butchered or shot. One night, five people were shot in two hours, including a 45-year-old woman who was just doing her laundry here on Silver Avenue. That's when the gunman walked in, shot, and killed her. People were scared to go out at night. Retired homicide inspector Gus Carreras headed the task force to find the killers. Mayor Joe Alioto ordered a citywide dragnet. Those extraordinary measures are going to involve stopping a number of people in San Francisco who fit a certain profile. Black, between 20 and 30, 5 feet 9 to 6 feet tall, of medium build. There are a lot of people in San Francisco who fit that description. The city was accused of civil rights abuse. Reverend Cecil Williams of Glide Church angrily pointed out the lack of random stops when cops were looking for the Zodiac killer six years earlier. They did not, in fact, begin to create a dragnet uh, and a police state as it relates to white participants. A federal court ended the stops, but what finally broke the case? Composite sketches. Death Angels member Anthony Harris saw himself in the drawings, and fearing for his life and seduced by the $30,000 reward money, he called the cops. And he laid everything out to us names, places, crimes committed. Four zebra suspects were convicted for 16 murders and remain in prison on life sentences. Anthony Harris was in witness protection. Today, 40 years later, the case is rarely discussed, almost forgotten. This was such a racially tinged, sensitive issue. Uh, a radical sect of the black Muslims killing white people. It's something that this country is not comfortable discussing or remembering. But it continues to haunt the memories of survivors and families of the murder victims. In San Francisco, Linda Yee, KPIX 5. Well, police stopped and searched more than 500 black men as part of Operation Zebra. The killer's trial lasted more than a year, and at the time, it was the longest trial in California history.
Rodgers badly hurt. round of the fight for anybody. Frazier was within a bunch or two of going down. The doctor comes up and looks at Frazier. I think it's going to be over. It's all over. In 1975, Elijah Muhammad died, and his son W.D. sparked a revolution. He denounced his father's beliefs and began to break up his movement. With the passing of the leader, we saw a need to uh, go to the holy book of all the Muslims and base ourselves right there and uh, root ourselves right in the Quran. He told his father's followers that their religion had been based on folklore and mythology. I can't say we were really believing in Islam, but we were innocent and we thought we were believing in Islam. Elijah Muhammad gave us a myth, a myth that boosted the ego and, and made us feel good about ourselves. I don't see white people as a devil, I see any bad person as a devil. I was successful, thank God, in getting most of the followers of my father to see the Quran as the direction for us. I'm still very much in line with my father's social reform message, though I've uh, put down his religion. <laughs> But one of Sadiq's old colleagues followed a very different path, Louis Farrakhan. Sadiq remembers how Farrakhan became disillusioned when W.D. Muhammad embraced Orthodox Islam. Farrakhan missed the limelight and hated the criticism of Elijah Muhammad. It was very difficult for many people to come to grips with the fact that many of the things that we had learned were not accurate. Uh, coming to grips with it was difficult for Minister Farrakhan coming to grips with with uh, having been deceived in many uh, instances and uh, uh, I heard Minister Farrakhan himself said he had been deceived eventually he returned to preaching that Elijah Muhammad was the divine messenger after about three years of my leadership uh, Farrakhan uh, Minister Farrakhan uh, he came to me and he told me that uh, he has been trying to go along, but it's become more difficult uh, for him to go along with, with things that I was saying about the Honorable Elijah, about my father, he said, um, to discredit him. Farrakhan disagreed with the turn that I made to the real Islam, and he decided to go back and revive the nation of Islam. I said Hitler was a wickedly great man. I didn't make a mistake. I know the language, you taught it to me white folks, now all of a sudden you got dumb to the meaning of what great is.
By deliberate provocation and calculated showmanship, Louis Farrakhan created a new following. To the anger of his old colleagues, he presented himself as a Muslim, even though what he taught had little to do with Orthodox Islam. Will you do that, America? Will you stop us? The strategy now is offensive in the sight of God. That's unacceptable. That's wrong. And I think that strategy has to find its ending if Minister Farrakhan is going to save himself. And if you do, what shall our response be? What did you say? This was Farrakhan's greatest triumph. He organized the Million Man March to Washington to express black pride under the banner of the Nation of Islam. Farrakhan's soldiers were conspicuously deployed. He still teaches them that white men are the devil created by a mad black scientist. But Farrakhan's public mask is much more rational. And the Kerner Commission to men of all religions and beliefs, Farrakhan presents himself as the successor to Martin Luther King. And saw that America was worse today than it was in the time of Martin Luther King Jr. There's still two Americas, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Civil rights was the black demand of the 60s and 70s. Now, both Farrakhan and Orthodox Muslims believe that blacks must help themselves rather than rely on government. And I will strive, and I will strive, I will strive to, build business, to build business, build houses, build hospitals. Reverend Jesse Jackson of the Rainbow Coalition, who spoke at the Million Man March. Dr. Alvin Poussant, professor of psychiatry, Harvard Medical School, who attended the march. Merle Evers Williams, she's in Atlanta and she's chairperson of the NAACP. And in New York, Congressman Gary Franks, Republican of Connecticut, who was opposed to the march. We'll start with Gary. Did it turn out better than you thought, Gary? Well, obviously, when you have uh, 400,000 people in attendance, uh, it would definitely, definitely be a sign of uh, success for uh, Mr. Farrakhan. However, my position would, would be the same. I, I felt that the efforts of the Nation of Islam would result in uh, dividing this country. I believe that the record of the Nation of Islam is very, very clear. They have expressed hatred toward uh, whites, toward Jews, toward Catholics. And they've also expressed an opinion that uh, we should have uh, a separate nation uh, and or maybe a reservation-like uh, existence for, for African Americans. And I strongly uh, disagree with, uh, with those positions. So nothing happened today to change your opinion of that? No, and I, and I think that we have organizations that supported my position. You have the National Urban League who, who shared my, my opinion. You have the NAACP. You have the... The, uh, the national black minister sharing my opinion. You had Angela Davis, you had John Lewis, you had a long list of individuals who felt uh, very, in the same way in which I did, Larry. It's really so foolish, you know, are you using the part with, with Pat Buchanan who says America's a Christian culture? Are you the cold campaign manager for Phil Graham out of Texas? He's in the, in the part with Strom Thurmond, Jesse Hams. All these guys who have expressed racism with You're state power. Gary Franks being yes, in absolutely. That and so to, to center this march on, on an organization and a person, 
It's to miss the implications of perhaps a million men coming together, A, seeking to be better people, B, seeking to register and vote, and perhaps most critically, seeking to reconnect with their families, I mean, to pay alimony, to fight domestic violence and, and wife battering. I mean, some real good stuff came out of this march today, and so to be absent as a kind of an armchair analyst does no real good service. Koreans or Asians are coming to our community and establish grocery stores and cleaners for us. We have very good black cleaners in Oakland. We should patronize these black cleaners. You should feel awful bad taking your clothes to an Asian cleaners when you have brothers and sisters that have cleaners. I mean, I'm not against our Asian brothers and sisters, but I am for self. And I think that if they can build Chinatown, then we should have something for ourselves. I think they have built a beautiful example for us as black people. You see very few Asians in safe ways in lucky stores. They shop at their own stores. Then you should see very few black people in Asian cleaners, in an Asian uh, uh, establishment where, unless we don't have them, if we don't have them, fine. We should not patronize liquor stores and, and people that sell pig and alcohol to our people. We should discourage that so that they can use their good minds and good brains and establish something that is to serve humanity rather than destroy. After the Express published Thompson's articles, someone smashed the windows at the paper's offices. Less than a year later, Yusef Bey died of cancer, before he could be tried for the rape charges. Chauncey Bailey wrote his obituary. Bay chose one of his spiritual followers to run the business. He left behind about a dozen wives and over 40 children. Had he gone to trial and been convicted, it would have been very difficult for the bakery to retain any sort of political pull in this city. But I think political leaders still felt able to embrace the bakery to some extent. Uh, even though it now had this mark on its past, it wasn't a, a legally binding mark. The East Bay Express published an obituary of its own, for which Thompson received regular threats from bakery members. Then Yusef Bay's successor went missing and was later found buried in the Oakland Hills. We had predicted in our stories that they were probably going to turn their guns on each other now, and they started. But, you know, it also drove home the fact that they were willing to carry out these death threats if they, you know, really felt inclined. So Chris Thompson left town for several months. In the meantime, one of Yusef Bey's younger sons had taken control of the organization. But he was killed in October 2005, the victim of a carjacking attempt. A month later, 19-year-old Yusef Bey IV made his presence known. He allegedly led a group of men to two Oakland liquor stores, all in an attempt to address a pressing community issue. Well, liquor stores, I think that, you know, of course, I mean, common sense, liquor stores shouldn't be in our community like it is. 
Every liquor store, there are drug activities. Every liquor store, they're hanging out. Every liquor store, there it's, it's, it's a gang, it's a magnet for gang violence. I mean, in my opinion, I don't call for the government or the city to do anything, but I do think that our people shouldn't allow it. It's just, you know, it's upsetting when you think that people can um, just think that they can just act any old kind of way because they got a bow tie on. I had met some of the young men prior to Dr. Bay's death, but after he was buried, I had no more contact with the bakery because I assumed that there would be a power struggle. I knew that given access to large amounts of cash, they would do something stupid. To vandalize the liquor store on tape didn't make much sense. So I would not have been surprised at anything they did, even murder. Walmart. The reason why they didn't pay the murder on me because Walmart. He saw my baby going even because they wanted to pay me. They wanted to make some like some I was in charge. And he warned to me I could have went on doing it. Even though he said I didn't right. do it, but Walmart said I might even have you involved with that because it made the baby look terrible. I said, yeah, yeah, it would have been fucking did it. <laughs> All betterment groups, no matter who they are, there is a surah in the Holy Quran called the Allies. And in that particular surah, it talks about those who believe and want to help man should stand shoulder to shoulder in ranks. See, and what we should do is drop all of the division all of the false ideas and false ideology that we've all fallen victim to and remove the scale from over our eyes and be able to judge a tree by the fruit it bear and judge a man or an organization by its works. The works of the Church of Scientology should be held in high esteem of us all. So groups like the Nation of Islam, the Catholic Church, the Muslims all over the world if we see the good of one another, we should take that good, learn from it, get in exchange, you see, do what other nations do, trade, trade to the point to where we're in exchange. And so I'm just thankful that in this hour that I found a betterment group that we were told in the nation of Islam that at a time in our development, we would meet other purified people who would show us things that we can be in exchange with and take tools back to our community and help our people.
Millions turned out for the first women's march two years ago, but tomorrow's attendance now splintering over a war of words. Some march leaders accused of making anti-Semitic remarks, and one, Tamika Mallory, under fire for supporting Louis Farrakhan, known for a history of anti-Semitic comments. The satanic Jews that control everything and mostly everybody. In this Instagram post, Mallory calling Farrakhan the greatest of all time, leading to this exchange on The View. I don't agree with these statements. At the end of the day... You won't condemn the, it. No, no, no. To be very clear, it's not my language. Now the event that spawned a sea of pink hats over Donald Trump's words is paying the price. Several big-name groups pulling out of the event, and many Democratic leaders staying away. The presidential hopeful Senator Kirsten Gillibrand will march in Iowa. This as national organizers try to quell the controversy. Jewish women and Jewish women of color, which is a constituency that I represent, overwhelmingly support the unity principles of the Women's March. Including Mallory talking to NBC News. We unequivocally stand against anti-Semitism, and we are committed personally and as an organization to fighting it. Hoping these words will be enough. Ann Thompson, NBC News.